the fixed rehabilitation in the anterior maxillary sector doesn't satisfy the aesthetical needs of the patient and it is also characterized by restorative margins which are inadequate associated with extensive caries. A careful radiograph examination of this sextant confirms significant biological damage to the hard tissue of the teeth due to an incongruous prosthesis. Despite this, the presence of teeth elements can be appreciated, characterised by root structures which are favourable for clinical crown lengthening. The integrity of the hard and soft tissues must be restored. After removing the prosthesis and anaesthetizing both the sides, the biometric periodontal parameters are checked. In particular, periodontal probing is carried out on the vestibular, interproximal and palatal aspect of all the teeth elements present. The marginal thickness is meticulously studied. It can be concluded that these structures are typical of a thin periodontal biotype. Given the absence of pathological periodontal measurements, an intracircular incision is made which starts on the distal aspect of the left maxillary canine. It remains strictly intracircular, carefully maintaining the height of the papilla which is present. The aim of this incision is to raise a partial thickness vestibular flap, thinning the papillae whilst preserving their height and shape in a sector which is so important aesthetically. The intracircular incision, characterised by the direction of the scalpel, which is parallel to the long axis of the teeth, ends on the distal aspect of the upper left maxillary canine. The operation continues with further thinning of all the interdental papillae, one after another. Starting from the coronal extremity, up to the respective base, maintaining, however, the full papilla height. The incision extends further in an apical direction. Continuing to raise the flap and thinning it, maintaining partial thickness. Thus connecting the previously separately raised papilla units. A thinned flap of homogeneous thickness is carefully raised so that at the end of the operation it can be adequately adapted to an osseous structure which has also been finished and thinned. It is advisable to carry out this step with extreme caution in order to avoid perforating the flap or the papillae. On the palatine side, the flap design foresees a paramarginal scallop. At 3 to 4 mm from the gingival margin. Starting intracircularly on the first left maxillary premolar. And ending still intracircularly. on the first right maxillary premolar. This incision, carried out with a 15C blade in a direction which is almost perpendicular to the palatine bone, is aimed at creating a bleeding line. It makes it possible for the surgeon to see the entity of the keratinized tissue which will subsequently be removed. After designing the flap, the surgical blade, which is positioned parallel to the palatine bone and within this scalloped line, starts to separate the palatine tissue, thus creating an external primary palatine flap, which will be preserved, and an internal secondary palatine flap, which is usually eliminated when it is not necessary to combine an osseous surgery therapy with a mucogingival therapy for prosthesis purposes.
the blade remains within the first incision made for the whole distance. Restarting from the first intracircular incision on the first right maxillary premolar to thin the most coronal part of the palatine flap, using surgical pincers to facilitate the 15C blade, the palatine tissue is further lifted and thinned. This technique makes it possible to obtain a thinned palatine flap characterised by, on its most coronal aspect, a minimal thickness which will then be gradually increased in its apical aspect. Having reached the desired apical distance, the blade once again changes direction and points towards the underlying bone structure in order to then delicately remove the underlying connective tissue. Subsequently, the secondary flap is disepithelialized, taking advantage of its adherence to the palate. A long-handled yellow ring olive burr is used for this. Mounted on a contra-angle handpiece in association with generous irrigation. This burr is very suitable and very effective in the interproximal spaces. Continuing with the first step for peeling away the secondary palatine flap, entering with a 15C blade within the interdental sulcus of every tooth concerned, trying with rotary movements of the fingers and consequently of the blade to favour the initial peeling away. It's very important to carefully and delicately carry out this manoeuvre in order to preserve the integrity of these structures since they will be used as a connective tissue graft on the vestibular side in order to obtain an increase in the thickness of the soft tissue. A bone chisel is then used, a CTGO, which is very suitable, due to its small dimensions, for the interproximal spaces. Enough pressure is exerted on the bone to raise a portion of palatal tissue. Rotary movements of the fingers are advisable for peeling away the fibrous palatal tissue, levering on the bone, but strictly avoiding any pushing movement which would risk lacerating the flap due to loss of control of the instrument. After this first peeling step of the coronal portion, the marginal bone crest is exceeded and, always in a coronal apical direction, arrive at the base of the primary palatine flap. It is always possible to make use of the cutting edge of the CTGO to definitively raise this tissue. In order to remove it, causing even less trauma, a 15C blade can be used to cut the last fragments of tissue at the base of the flap. During this delicate peeling stage, the object of which is to preserve the integrity of the tissue, it is advisable to irrigate frequently, so as to be able to see better the places which still offer resistance to its removal. Again, with the use of surgical pincers and the CTGO, the last residual fibres are peeled away and in a non-traumatic way, the graft is removed from the palatal donor site to then adapt it to the vestibular side. This is how to correctly position the papillae in the corresponding interproximal spaces and the amount of tissue removed.
After this quick check, the palatine tissue is removed with pincers and positioned in a sterile container with physiological solution. Then the preparation into operation of the abutments is carried out using a flame burr with the aim of optimising the prosthesis preparation, trying to paralyse the prosthesis abutments and at the same time trying to eliminate underlying undercuts. This prosthesis preparation is extended to all the vestibular, palatal and interproximal surfaces of all the teeth elements. At the end of this manoeuvre, the correct apical positioning of the palatine flap is checked, which should be exactly in bone crest. Passing to the vestibular side, where at this point the palatine flap is placed and the entity of the coronal movement of the vestibular flap is evaluated, necessary for complete coverage of the graft. Periosteal incisions are made in the internal and apical part of the flap. With the help of surgical pincers which hold the flap, it is possible to see the more marked passivity. Once again, the ideal positioning of the tissue is evaluated before starting suturing first the graft and then the vestibular flap. A resorbable 5 zeros Dexon thread is used with a CA2 needle and a simple suspended suture is made, called a sling suture, to firmly stabilise the graft to the root structure and put it in a coronal position. This technique doesn't involve the palatine flap. The needle penetrates the graft on its most coronal aspect in a vestibular lingual direction, then passing in the interproximal space, embracing the root on its palatal aspect, passing through the other interproximal space, and again in a vestibular lingual direction, catching the graft and returning as it had previously come out. Finally, making a knot on the vestibular aspect. This technique is repeated in a number of places in order to firmly stabilise the graft to the root structure and put it in a coronal position. Other periosteal incisions are carried out in the internal and apical part of the flap to accentuate the coronal movement and to obtain complete coverage of the graft. Another such a stitch is made to stabilise the graft in its most distal portion. The vestibular flap is coronalised in an atraumatic way using two surgical pincers to obtain complete coverage of the graft. E PTFE such a thread is used for the simultaneous closing of the two flaps vestibular and palatal. Suturing of the vestibular flap starts involving the interincisor papilla. The needle then passes in a vestibular lingual direction, catching the palatal papilla, passing in the interproximal space, distal to the two incisors, catching the vestibular papilla between the lateral central, repassing in the interproximal space, then returning on the vestibular side of the interincisor papilla, and making the closing knot. This simple suspended suture technique, repeated in correspondence with all the papillae and interdental spaces, guarantees a coronal movement of the vestibular flap and an optimal coronal sealing of the two flaps. As can be seen, the modification applied to the classical simple suturing technique of catching the palatine flap has become necessary in order to guarantee the desired positioning of the suture and avoid its probable coronal dislocation, favoured by the conical shape of the abutments.
Vestibular anchorage is used with horizontal mattress suctures on both sides to guarantee greater stability and pressure of the vestibular flap on the underlying periosteum and avoiding dead spaces on the palatal side. This such a technique is carried out with EPTFE CV5 thread with an RC16 needle in correspondence with all the interproximal spaces. The mattress suture is carried out apically to the mucogingival line, catching firstly the flap, then the underlying periosteum from which it immediately separates for entering the flap and exiting. Going palatally, exerting pressure and stabilisation of the vestibular flap on the underlying graft and the periosteal bed. In correspondence with the palatal side, the same route is followed, without catching the periosteum, but always exerting pressure on the palatine flap. It is possible to see adequate control of bleeding, which is mostly favoured by this such a technique. On the palatal versant, it is possible to see the adaptation of the palatine flap to the underlying bone structure, to the relative prosthesis abutments, and also the adequate positioning of the bone ridge. Thanks to this occlusal view, the thickening obtained can be observed on the vestibular side, preserving the aesthetical aspect of this structure. When healing is advanced, before reconstructing the prep structure with the prosthesis, this case is finalised with six single crowns. Comparing the various surgical stages, images of the start of the therapy, the improvement in quality and quantity of the soft tissue on the vestibular aspect can be observed.